patients undergoing cancer therapy without direction from their doctor. They were not told to do this. The ones who were on a high fiber diet were the ones who had a substantially improved survival. And every five grams of fiber that they added to their diet increased their life expectancy by 30% because 95% of Americans are deficient in fiber. And it's not just that fiber is what matters. It's that in order to get fiber, you have to eat plant foods. And so if we would eat, increase our fiber intake, we would be eating more plant foods and we would be addressing this issue, I think, in a quite powerful way. Colorectal cancer, we don't have that type of thing of tobacco. What we have instead is our diet and the influence of our diet on the lining of our intestines and our microbiome. And it, um, our microbiome plays a role in either protecting us or failing to protect us from colorectal cancer. Um, people who follow a carnivore diet, this is a framework that allows them to completely and totally eliminate ultra-processed foods. Um, it also is a zero carbohydrate, zero fiber diet. I think that when they, when they claim, like, I don't think they're lying when they claim that their, for example, autoimmune disease improves. I think that they're, I think that's a return to a diet that does not include these food additives and who knows which food additive is causing those issues for them, triggering their immune system. When they claim that it's good for their gut health. I unfortunately don't think they actually understand what they're saying. The current healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. Welcome to the Crisco & Company podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lee Crisco. Our guest today is New York Times bestseller, Will Bolsowitz, MD. He's author of Fiber Fuel, the plant-based gut health program for losing weight, restoring your health, and optimizing your microbiome. He is a board-certified, award-winning gastroenterologist that has published many peer-reviewed articles in top American gastroenterology journals. He's also been featured in Shape, Women's Health, Men's Health, and the Huffington Post. He lives in South Carolina with his wife and four children. Welcome, Dr. Bolsowitz. Thanks for doing this. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, here's a question I like to ask my guests because I'm always quite interested in the answer. How did you stumble into the whole food plant-based lifestyle? I think stumble into is an appropriate term um, because I this was not a plan. Um, these are things that happened and choices that I made and they led me to this place. And, you know, people are free to interpret that however they like. I, in, in many ways, believe that this was almost... Um, divine intervention. I was intended mm -hmm. to be doing the things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, and it, and it started really with, um, having my own issues. So I, I grew up wanting to be a doctor. This was my lifelong dream. I started that journey when I was 18 years old and I spent 16 years chasing after that dream working, you know, I mean, I would average it out to probably say 80 or 90 hours a week. Mm -hmm. and. During that time, the um, the intensity of it, it, it really sort of forces you to give everything that you have to the process. And there's very little that's left for you. So with that little bit of time that is your own, you just want to enjoy it. And so for me in those moments, I found pleasure in food and I didn't have a lot of money. I was quite poor. And so to me, doing things like going for fast food, going to Taco Bell, things of that variety, um, it uh, was something that I enjoyed. It was inexpensive. It was convenient. It fit so nicely into my life. And I paid a price for that. Um, it caught up to me when I was in my early 30s. And I, you know, it feels like I would wake up and look in the mirror and not recognize the man before me. Um, how did I get to this place where I was 50 pounds overweight, anxious, depressed, um, many things in my life professionally were going incredibly well. And to an outsider, you would think that my life was perfect. And on the inside, I was miserable. 
and I was not in a good place. And I, and I knew that things needed to change. And I tried to work my way out of the hole because I'm a, you know, um, when push comes to shove, I start working harder. And so, um, I tried to work my way out of this hole through exercise and was quite aggressive about my exercise routine. And it didn't deliver the results that I was looking for. Not to say that there's no value. I'm a huge believer, but um, it didn't give me what I needed. And um, and leave one day, I made a choice rather than going. I was in North Carolina. I was in my gastroenterology fellowship at the University of North Carolina. And I made the choice instead of going to Hardee's for dinner, where I could get a hot dog and a double cheeseburger and fries and an apple pie for five bucks. Um, rather than doing that, I went home and I made a giant smoothie. Oh, wow. And I instantly felt the difference mm -hmm. because rather than having that sort of post meal hangover where you have to lay on the couch and make groaning noises, I actually felt energized and it felt like something that I had been missing was now there. And I think that for people who have um, felt unwell when you discover something that relieves you of that burden, then it's actually incredibly motivating because you just want to feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was. And so it's an ironic thing that I spent 16 years studying medicine. This was my lifelong dream. And yet in the moment where I needed the medicine myself, I opted to go in a different direction. And it completely changed my life because once that happened for me, by, by changing my diet, once that happened for me as a person who you know, cares deeply about this dream of being a medical doctor, I was compelled to bring this to my patients. And I was compelled to spend my free time studying nutrition and learning more about this and how I could use this in a gastroenterology practice. And then when I saw the way in which this was changing the lives of my patients and realizing that this is not a part of conventional medical education, Yet every person deserves to learn about these things. Everyone deserves to be empowered with this knowledge. I felt then at that point, years later, this was roughly now 2016. The genesis of the story is like roughly 2012, 2013. Um, around 2016, I felt compelled to share this, this story with the world. And it, that's what started this sort of divergent journey that took me outside of what I intended to do as a medical doctor and allowed me to create social media and do podcasts and write books and now do all these different things. Yeah. So are you not practicing as a guest right now, or are you just doing uh, the uh, media stuff? So my, um, there's a number of things that I do. And my first book, Fiber Fuels, came out in 2020. It was, I mean, it came out in May of 2020. I, I didn't think that anything was going to happen. And it completely changed my life in the sense that it opened up a lot of doors and it also um, created a tremendous amount of attention. And so I ended up in this place where over the course of the next two years, I, I effectively felt like there were three things that I was trying to juggle and it was impossible for me to juggle all three. Mm -hmm. And one was um, being a full-time gastroenterologist and one, one was being an author and ha having a public platform where I try to you know, inspire and empower millions of people. And the third is my family. Mm -hmm. And I felt like if I don't make a choice, the one that gets sacrificed is the family. And that's not something that I was willing to do. And so yeah. ultimately I made the decision in 2022 to leave my practice. And so I, I, now I write books. I'm um, constantly participating in creating free content for people that, you know, is intended to give them a credible source of information I'm the U.S. medical director of a large nutrition company called Zoe. Um, oh, with really? that, I also yeah. do research. So, you know, I've published a number of papers, um, including we have a paper that we just published in Nature Medicine um, in May of this year. So, so I'm, I'm actively involved in research. And I also launched a supplement company at the beginning of this year called 38 Terra, which was also a three-year endeavor for me. That's something I've been working on for quite some time, trying to basically basically create the supplements that I always thought were missing in my gastroenterology practice. And so like, to me, it's um, the pursuit of a mission. 
And the mission is conceptually the same as what it was when I was 18 years old, which is to enrich the lives of other people using my knowledge as a medical doctor. It's just a total shift into a place that I wasn't expecting it to go, where no longer is it one on one with a limited number of people that live, you know, in my community. Now this has expanded to some bigger idea, which is, can I influence the diet and the lifestyle and also create um, appropriate supplements that will impact the lives of millions of people across the globe. Yeah. And so, and that's, that, that's now what my focus is on. You know, it's, you make a good point, you know, because when you're a doctor, you're really only interact with one patient at a time, but now with the platform that you have, you're influencing thousands of people. Um, I was uh, super impressed with your book. I mean, there's just so much packed in there. Uh, there's parallels with, you know, the, the uh, journey that you've had and the one that I had, I sort of had my eyes closed. I was a doctor for many, many years before I fully realized the you know, connection with food and uh, came to look at what I do as a diagnostic radiologist in a very different way, which is really that I'm sitting there diagnosing common lifestyle diseases. I hadn't really fully made that connection until I read Michael Greger's book. Um, and so that's what's motivated us to do this website and try to educate people. Um, but uh, and, and in a way, when you work in mainstream healthcare, you feel like a little bit of a voice in the wilderness because most doctors just don't get it. And, no, uh, certainly not. You, I go into the patient's medical records frequently to get more information, interpret their scan, and they'll be on you know several medications for a variety of lifestyle diseases. And it's like if only they and their doctors knew that there's a better path. Um, in in your book, you were saying that. Uh, uh, 70 million Americans have digestive is issues like heartburn, abdominal pain, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. Um, so why is this so common in the American population and what needs to be done about it? Yeah, I mean, and 70 million is probably a conservative estimate, to be totally honest with you. At 70 okay. million is about 20% of the American population. I think it could be as high as double that. Wow. Um, so, and it really depends also on how we want to define this, right? Because digestive health issues, many of them are diagnosed based upon symptoms. And many people experience symptoms. That doesn't necessarily mean that they meet the criteria for having one of these digestive health problems, but yet they may still experience symptoms on a routine basis. And to me, if your digestive health is negatively affecting your quality of life on any level, Right? If you have any sort of fear of food or concern that you're going to suffer from bloating or, or constipation or diarrhea or abdominal discomfort, whether we qualify you as having irritable bowel syndrome or not doesn't matter. We have something going on that we need to address. We need to make you better. And so, yeah, so I, I actually think it could be even more than that. But the, the number that you're, um, you're citing actually comes from my own research, which I published in the journal Gastroenterology years ago. So um, why, why? Well, I think that there's a number of different aspects to this. To reduce it down to just one factor would be an oversimplification. But um, if I were to say, what is the dominant factor? What is the number one thing that if we could address this one thing, I really think it would address this issue in a powerful way, not make it completely disappear, but really make a dent in terms of making this better. I think it's our fiber deficiency. Um, there's been a massive shift in our diet that's taken place in the last 100 years. It really um, started after World War II with the introduction of ultra processed foods and convenience foods, and simultaneously the United States um, creating mass agriculture such that foods that weren't affordable to people in the past became affordable at that time. So an example of this is meat. Meat has always been um, a, uh, a food of affluence. So third world countries that don't have the socioeconomic status that we have in the United States, they, that's not what they eat. They eat beans and rice or some sort of grain and legume. Um, and that's what they subsist on. And actually, this is probably part of the reason why many of these third world countries have a longer life expectancy than we do, right. even though they spend way less money on healthcare and don't have access to doctors like you and I 
mm-hmm. in their country. Um, so this shift that's taken place, what has happened is we've gone from consuming whole foods and consuming a diet that was dominated by plant foods to a diet where plant foods are nearly non-existent. In the average American's diet, just 10% of their calories comes from whole plant foods. And sadly, the number one plant is the potato. Right. And I'm not anti-potato, but that is not the most nutritious of all plant foods that exists. And most of the time when people are eating potatoes, they're eating French fries. Right. Um, And 90% of our calories come from a combination of animal products where the fiber content is clearly defined. It's zero. And, um, and additionally, ultra processed foods, which to qualify as ultra processed, you know, to be clear, this is not a processed food, processed food could be like literally chopping up a salad, could be chewing your food. Ultra processed is when we take something in a, in a lab, um, something that is not possible for you or I, or people that we know to cook and prepare at home. And it requires a food scientist to basically mix together different ingredients and put it, reconstruct the food and sell it, you know, in a market, in a, in a bag or a box where it will sit on that shelf for months on end and not go wrong, not go bad. Um, so I, I really think that this shift is the driving factor and it gets summarized quite simply with fiber because 95% of Americans are deficient in fiber. And it's not just that fiber is what matters. It's that in order to get fiber, you have to eat plant foods. And so if we would eat, increase our fiber intake, we would be eating more plant foods and we would be addressing this issue, I think, in a quite powerful way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an uphill battle because a lot, like a lot of people really think that they need meat, like meat is the cornerstone of their diet. And for a lot of people, that's a hard sell that actually should be plants that should be the cornerstone of your diet. So. Uh, what is the relationship between dietary fiber and the microorganisms in our gut and our health? Fiber is undergoing a renaissance, or at least if I have my way, it will undergo a renaissance. I, I'm more than happy to be the you know lead person pounding the drum on behalf of fiber. Um, when we were kids we grew up with an image of fiber being the orange drink that our grandmother drank so that she could have a bowel movement. Could it get any more boring and less appealing? It just comes across so bland and um, unattractive. And yet um, there's a new science that has been emerging in the last 15 or 20 years that was brought on through a combination of events. Part of it is we needed the computers to actually be powerful enough. And part of it is laboratory technology that we needed to develop so that we could go beyond what grows in a Petri dish, because that was our traditional way of measuring microbes. And combining these events, high-powered computers that can handle a tremendous amount of information, because that's what we'll find in the microbiome, and simultaneously new techniques that allow us to get a glimpse into the RNA and the DNA of these microbes is what has facilitated this breakthrough where um, it's like discovering an entire world that exists around us as we sit here and speak to one another. Um, Microbes are everywhere. If there's no microbes, it's because humans have done something to sterilize it. But we, I have a microbiome, you have a microbiome, the people at home listening to us have a microbiome, the trees have a microbiome, our food has a microbiome. Um, and the microbiome is a part of who we are. It's not um, uh, actually ours, it's separate. It's alive as you and I are. It's made up of at least hundreds of different species. And it covers all external surfaces of our body. So from our head to our toes, inside of our nose, inside of our mouth, inside of a woman's vagina, but most concentrated inside of our colon, which is our large intestine. And so now in this place, you will find this community of microorganisms, and they're they're actually, in an interesting way, much similar to you and I. 
um, that, you know, it's hard for us to conceptualize this because we can't see them. But if we took a microscope and we zoomed in, what you would see is there's many different types. They have different skill sets. They're not all the same. Certain ones do certain things. They have cliques and certain friends that they like to hang out with. Mm. They have different personalities. Some of them are friendly. Some of them are not so friendly. They have different food preferences. They don't all like to eat the same stuff. But what we know for the good ones, the ones that want to support human health, we know that they love fiber. Fiber is their preferred food. And fiber is unique because when we, when we consume fiber-based foods, basically meaning plant foods, we as humans lack the enzymes to digest our fiber, which is where the idea of, oh, fiber just runs through you. That's where that comes from. And what we now understand is, no, that's not true. Fiber doesn't just run through you. Fiber makes its way through your small intestine unchanged because there's no enzymes to digest it. And it arrives into the colon where this ecosystem of microbes is concentrated. And they have the enzymes that we need to process and break down our fiber. And they go to work as teams. And so different ones are doing, using different enzymes at different times to basically unpack the fiber. And what happens is transformation. Fiber stops being fiber. It's no longer fiber and it's not going back. It has now become something called short chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. And these short chain fatty acids, I started medical school in 2002. So I've been studying medicine for more than 20 years. These are by far the most anti inflammatory compounds that I've come across. And we could do, I mean, I'll, you know, we're not going to do this, but let me summarize by saying that we could do an entire hour talking about the effects of the short chain fatty acids right there in our colon on the microbiome, protecting us from intestinal cancers, like colorectal cancer, their effect on the immune system, on our metabolism, on our hormones. They travel all the way up to our brain. They affect, affect our blood brain barrier. They actually cross into the brain. And there are a number of different ways in which they can impact our cognitive health, our brain health, even our mood. Um, and last but not least, there's this sort of conception that you are born with a genetic code and that genetic code is a program, like a program for your life. That's not the way that it works. And instead, the genetic code is much more like a switchboard. And you can flip switches on and off. And sitting at that switchboard, controlling these genes are our microbes. And so, so it's quite powerful when you think about like, Lee, as a medical doctor, I'm sure you can appreciate that when we talk about digestion, access to nutrients, and the immune system, and our metabolism, and our hormones, and our mood, and our cognitive health, and how we express our genetic code, basically is a summary of human health. And it all touches back to this one command center, the microbiome. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as you said in your book that you can even do a spinal tap on someone and find these short chain fatty acids in their cerebral spinal fluid, which is so different from that concept of fiber that is just kind of a passive broom sweeping things, things out. Exactly. Um, you know, here's something I was, was wondering about. What is the relationship to cancer, both gastrointestinal cancer and non-gastrointestinal cancer and fiber? Well, in my favorite fiber study of all time, it seems like an opportune uh, time for me to pull out my favorite fiber study, which was published in The Lancet, one of the top medical journals on the planet by Andrew Reynolds. They found a number of different benefits to dietary fiber. And one of them is that people who consumed more dietary fiber were, were less likely to die of cancer. They were also less likely to be diagnosed with multiple different types of cancer. And that included esophageal cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. Um, now, colorectal cancer is um, worthy of like a little bit of extra attention because it's a massive problem in the United States and one that I spent many years as a gastroenterologist trying to fight. This is the number two cause of cancer death in America. The number one cause is lung cancer. Lung cancer has a clear 
cause, which is smoking. Not that everyone who gets lung cancer has been a smoker, but the majority have. Um, colorectal cancer, we don't have that type of thing of tobacco. What we have instead is our diet and the influence of our diet on the lining of our intestines and our microbiome. And it, um, our microbiome plays a role in either protecting us or failing to protect us from colorectal cancer. And one of the ways in which this is possible is that they produce short chain fatty acids and the short chain fatty acids through a number of different mechanisms are able to actually disrupt the replication of cancer cells because cancer is in its sort of simplified essence, the runaway multiplication of abnormal cells, abnormal tissue. And so in order to stop that, we have abnormal cells and abnormal tissue produced in our body all the time. It's not, our body is not so perfect that we don't produce abnormal cells. We do, but the body has the capacity to identify those abnormal cells and remove them prior to becoming a problem. And so, um, so with short chain fatty acids and colorectal cancer, there are a number of different ways through the microbiome, through short chain fatty acids, through their effects on specific parts of the cell where they're able to basically disrupt that replication process and then allow those cells to basically be eliminated. Now, we, one of the areas where, we, so um, the breakthrough with the microbiome came roughly 2006. That's when we first developed technology that allowed us to start to study this. And we've made great progress. We have better technology today than we did, you know, almost 20 years ago. Um, but we went through a period of time where what we were doing with microbiome research was just describing what we were seeing. And we still do this on some level. But what's exciting is that we're now transitioning into a new phase where we're using what we've learned and applying it to try to improve human health. And one of the areas where you see this most clear is actually in the treatment of cancer. The new treatments of cancer are called immunotherapy. And effectively what's happening is that we are actually, rather than directly attacking the cancer, we are instead empowering the patient's immune system and using their immune system to destroy the cancer. And what's fascinating is that they have discovered that the gut microbiome plays a quite powerful role in all of this. Um, much of this research comes out of MD Anderson, one of the top cancer centers in America. And it seems that where we've started is with melanoma first. Melanoma is the number one cause of um, death related to skin cancer. And what they noticed is that number one, people who receive antibiotics prior to immunotherapy do worse. Oh, interesting. And they asked the question, is it just because, are they just more sick? Mm -hmm. And so when they tested this accounting for how ill the, the, the person is and whether or not it truly is in isolation, the antibiotic, they discovered, no, it's true. The antibiotics are actually making these drugs less effective. So this implicated the microbiome. So next what they did is they tried fecal transplant in people who had failed immunotherapy. So these are people not who are getting immunotherapy for the first time. These are people who are sadly in a, in a predicament of desperation. And they said, well, let's try improving their microbiome with a fecal transplant and then give them the immunotherapy. And um, now this is a limited case series, but they discovered that in many of these people who had previously failed, many of them actually were cured of their melanoma. That's amazing. That's incredible. So I assume that they're try, uh, harvesting the microbiome of people that are basically disease-free and thought to be healthy. And so they're harvesting, they're harvesting the microbiome of people who are healthy. Now, um, defining like what is a healthy microbiome is not clear. Mm -hmm. But if it were me, I can tell you what I would want. I would want the microbiome of a person who eats a plant-based diet. Right, right. I'm just wondering, like, 
you know, in the United States where people tend to eat so poorly, how would you find someone that actually has a healthy microbiome? Just because they're like, if you had a young person that doesn't have any health problems, doesn't mean the microbiome is going to be optimal. But uh, yeah, no, totally agree. Um, these are points. These are points of relativity. Because if you compare the average American microbiome to the microbiome of a person who lives, for example, in the bush in Tanzania, mm -hmm. you will find that we have lost a tremendous amount of diversity. So in essence, what that means is we have far less species within our microbiome. And diversity is the measure of health within the ecosystem. Um, so the average American microbiome is less healthy than the average person who lives in a third world country. The, um, uh, that being said, there is a resilience. There is a resilience. It's, it's quite shocking. The impact that you can make with small choices. We don't need to get the microbiome all the way back to where it was a hundred or 150 years ago. We just need to address the basics. And that includes fiber. And you know, as an example, and after they did this um, fecal transplant study, we, they followed this up by looking into, into fiber. And they discovered that the, the um, patients undergoing cancer therapy without direction from their doctor, they were not told to do this. The ones who were on a high fiber diet were the ones who had a substantially improved survival. And every five grams of fiber that they added to their diet increased their life expectancy by 30%. Oh, wow. That's staggering. Five grams is nothing. Five, five grams, grams is nothing. But five, grams, but five grams to the average American is actually quite substantial when you put it within the context of the average American is around 15 grams. Right. right. So, but they should be, you know, women should be 25 and men should be 38. Right. So, and that, I would see that as kind of a minimum it, because if you look yeah. at these primitive societies like the Hadza, they're eating... 75, 100, 125 grams. Uh, but uh, uh, no, so how long does it take for these changes to occur? If someone modifies their diet, does it take months, years? So our gut microbiome is quite personal. Um, so like as an example, if you had an identical twin, you would only share somewhere in the range of 30 or 35% of the same microbes. So you would be more different than you would be the same, even though you are identical twins and you presumptively grew up in the same household, eating similar food, et cetera. Um, so it really depends on our starting point. Now, that being said, changes take place almost instantly. Mm -hmm. The food that we eat today will start to be reflected in our microbiome by tomorrow. Wow. But that is not a total overhaul. These are what initially seems small and then with consistency grows to be big. So I like to think about it in my mind like a snowball because you could start at the top of the mountain with a little pea-sized amount of snow. But as you roll that, that ball down the mountain, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and it builds momentum and it becomes very powerful. And that's the way it works with our microbiome. You could change your diet and you can initiate that snowball with choices that you make today. But if you come back and you continue to um, consume these, uh, these foods that are beneficial to your microbes, then that snowball starts to build momentum, grow stronger and stronger and more powerful. So, and I'm of the belief that after four weeks, we can make a substantial change to our microbiome. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people, when they make the switch to a plant-based diet, get a lot of GI upset, which is sort of what you're trying to counteract. What do you tell these people? I know it myself. I had quite a bit of discomfort initially, but I just jumped in like whole hog, by like cold turkey, just completely changed everything. What, what do you advise? How do you pe advise people on that? Yeah. So I think, I think it really comes from having an understanding of the way that this part of our body works. All right. Mm -hmm. So we have a gut microbiome that is adapted to whatever it is that you've been eating. And to make a change is to ask it to do something that it was not adapted for. And so it takes a period of time for it to make the adjustment and be able to compensate and like basically like readapt itself to whatever it is that you have introduced. Mm -hmm. To me, this is conceptually the same 
as exercise. Right. Which is that through exercise, our body is highly adaptable, right? No one said, I want to be a marathon runner and woke up and ran a marathon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They build towards that goal, but they start small, right? Short runs lead to longer runs, lead to longer runs that eventually lead to a marathon. Right. The same is true with building muscle. It's January 1st. You go to the gym. <laughs> um, you shouldn't lift so much weight that you hurt yourself. That would be a mistake. What you should do is you should lift a little bit more than what you normally lift. And you will grow stronger. And then when you come back, you can lift a little more than that. So I tend to say with the gut microbiome, the gut is a muscle. It can be trained. It can be made stronger. The way that we approach this is by starting low and going slow when we make dietary changes. So for a person who's really motivated to transition to a plant-based diet, um, although a cold turkey all at once cannonball into the deep end, um, for people that are highly motivated, you have to tough it out. And you know what I would say is this is predictable. This is predictable that, that your body would reject this initially because your body requires the opportunity to adapt to it. Um, but for the majority of people, if you, if you introduce these things slowly, much in the same way that you would exercise, then what you will discover is that your gut microbes are given the chance to grow stronger. They come along for the ride and then you don't have to experience those things. You feel better and your body comes, adapts with you. Yeah. Well, just, just, uh, as an interesting anecdote, by, by going absolutely cold turkey and changing everything right away, I was pre-diabetic and was gone in three days. Amazing. I'm not, I'm not totally shocked, sugar. but that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was running, you know, I'd get the odd blood sh fasting blood sugar over 100, so I met the criteria. And I read, uh, first I read Dr. Greger's book, and then I read Dr. Dougal's book and said, okay, I, I'm skeptical. I, I don't really think this is going to work. But I just went whole hog, you know, beans, peas, rice, corn, potatoes. And my blood sugar on, I think it was the third day was 65. It was at the bottom of the normal range. And I felt fine. Yeah. Other than the GI upset. But right. it, it was just quite miraculous. Um, tell us a bit about th these terms that people may find con confusing. Prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. And I think there's another category called symbiotics. Can you explain those to us? Yeah, definitely. So um, probiotics are, I'll start with probiotics because I, I believe that most people have heard of this term probiotics. And, you know, basically this is in reference to live microorganisms, could be bacteria, could be yeast or both, that um, have been demonstrated to have a beneficial effect on human health. All right. So we classically think of this as something that we would take in supplement form, like you take a capsule, that has got probiotics in it. But um, that's not the only thing that has probiotics. Mm -hmm. So we just need food that has live microorganisms. And all plants have a microbiome. So like as proof of this idea, if I take a head of cabbage and I chop it up and I submerge it in salt water, the, the probiotics that I need to create sauerkraut are already there. I don't need to add anything. Um, and those turn out to be many of the same things that you will find in a probiotic capsule. They're already there. Um, fermentation does amplify the production of microbes. So, and I'm of the belief, and there have been a number of studies that have supported this, that fermented foods, they're, a, first of all, a part of our food tradition for the vast majority of cultures across the, across the planet. But also, they're a way in which we can maintain a diet that's not completely sterile. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so probiotics are live microorganisms. All right. We have live microorganisms. We have probiotics living inside of us in our colon. And those microorganisms, in order to do their job, need to be fed. They are as alive as you and I are. If I'm not properly fed, I get hangry <laughs> and I'm not really good at my job. And when I am properly fed, I'm focused. 
and I'm much more effective. So um, prebiotics are the food for these microbes. And when you put these things together, when you, um, by the way, prebiotics, um, the classic is fiber. So when we were discussing earlier how fiber becomes short chain fatty acids, that is exemplifying what a prebiotic is. Um, resistant starch is another example of prebiotics. They're conceptually very similar to fiber. And, um, and then also we've discovered that polyphenols, which are the compounds that give plants their color, they also have a prebiotic effect. Okay. When you combine these things, prebiotics and probiotics, when you put them together, that's when the magic happens because the live microorganisms apply their enzymes to these prebiotics and transform them. And something different comes out the other side. Mm -hmm. And the production of short chain fatty acids is the classic example of this. And those are what we call postbiotics. When the microbes take the prebiotic and transform it into something that's beneficial for human health, we call that the postbiotic. The entire point is the postbiotic. That's what matters. And so we can hack this formula. But the truth is, if we just take pre if we just take probiotics and we never feed them, we'll never really get the benefit from them. And so in a society where 95% of us are fiber deficient, this is the place for us to start is to focus on the prebiotics and address that. Because if we do that, we will get more of the postbiotics. We also will actually empower more of the probiotics. So the whole thing ends up working in our favor. That's the way that we hack this formula. Mm -hmm. So it's it would be it, to just take a probiotic, it would be like throwing grass seeds on your driveway and hoping that the grass is going to grow without the soil. Yeah, I think I think that's a good analogy. You know, an analogy that I like yeah. to use is um, here's a quick example. Imagine that we want to have a delicious meal, all right, and we're, it's going to be a celebratory meal, and that's what we care about. That's what we're here for is this delicious meal. That's the postbiotic. The food is the postbiotic. All right. In order to do this, we need a chef. That's the probiotic. But we also need to give the chef the ingredients. That's the prebiotic. If you just had the ingredients, but you didn't have someone to cook it, it doesn't do you that much good. If you had a chef, but you don't actually have the fridge stocked with ingredients, that chef can't really do anything. When you put these two things together, you're able to take simple ingredients and a great chef and create something truly special. And so, and that's, that's the way that this works. Um, another area that I think would be interesting to people, given that, you know, weight management is such a struggle for so many people is the relationship between fiber and weight maintenance. And is there, are there some parallels between how fiber helps you manage your weight and these GLP one agonists that are on, that are so popular now? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's beyond parallel. It's actually, um, the physiology of these hormones. So GLP-1 is one of a class of what we call incretins or gut. These are gut derived hormones produced within the gut and produced in response to short chain fatty acids. And these are one of the mechanisms that explains why when people consume more fiber, they get better blood sugar control, which you exemplified for us that in three days, you were able to reverse your insulin resistance. When people consume more fiber, they're able to get better blood sugar control. They're also less hungry. They achieve better satiety. The research studies that show weight loss by consuming a plant-based diet are the result of not calorie counting. They're the result of a return to a more natural diet where we actually have to chew our food, spend time eating. That meal is high in fiber. It makes us feel full and satiated. And then we naturally just stop eating, mm -hmm. right? And that entire process involves fiber turning into short chain fatty acids, which activate GLP-1. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, 
I'm not, I, I don't think it's fair to make people who are using GLP-1 agonists and need them, because there are people who need them, make them feel bad. But do I believe that this is the solution to our problems in the United States? Absolutely not. And why would we turn to a drug that is extremely powerful, extremely expensive, and frankly, we don't really know what happens long term? Why would we turn to that when we haven't even done the fundamentals? The fundamentals are to, to basically just address our fiber gap, address our fiber deficiency, and see where that takes us. And if it takes us to a good place, which I'm quite positive it will, then we wouldn't have the need for all these drugs for the vast majority of people. Right, right. Now, one thing that people often wonder about is gluten. And there's a bit of a misconception out there that everybody should be avoiding gluten. Is that true? I don't believe so. Um, I certainly don't believe so. So uh, let's start with this. If you have celiac disease, which is a genetically motivated condition that affects about 1% of America, I'm telling you right now that you need to be gluten-free and there is, there is no turning back. All right. So regardless of what's going on with your celiac disease, once you're diagnosed with celiac disease, you should be gluten-free and you should be that way for the rest of your life. That leaves 99% of America that does not have celiac disease. And the question is, is gluten the cause of all the gut issues and things like this? And so there have been a couple of interesting studies that have asked this question. Here's an example of one, one of my favorites. They sent people home with three weeks worth of breakfast bars. All right, you would have uh, breakfast each day with one of these bars. And for one week, it would be gluten containing. And for one week, it would contain what are called fructans, which are a FODMAP. They're fermentable and they are found in all gluten containing foods. So you will always have fructans where there is gluten. And for one week, they would consume something that's just a placebo. And they would measure how people feel. These are people who believe that they have, they have gluten intolerance. So they're not able to consume gluten. All right, so now the important part is like they didn't know what week was what. And they wrote down how they felt. And the fascinating thing is that during the week that they were consuming gluten, again, these are people who believe that they have gluten intolerance. They actually had less symptoms than the placebo. Less. And during the week that they, they were consuming the fructans, they had more symptoms a lot more symptoms. And the reason why is because fructans are fermentable. Um, they can cause digestive distress, particularly in people that have underlying gut issues. So these are people who likely have underlying gut issues such as irritable bowel syndrome, and they're getting triggered by gluten containing foods, but it's not actually the gluten. It's probably the fructans. Now, fructans are not a bad thing. Um, fructans are actually a form of fiber. They're prebiotic. They're good for our microbiome. But much like fiber, much in the same way that we were discussing earlier, Lee, when a person starts to add more fiber to their diet, if you go too hard and too fast, you're not going to feel well. And too hard and too fast isn't necessarily a massive dietary overhaul. Too hard and too fast could be a person who's sensitive eating, you know, too much bread or eating, um, uh, chili with multiple beans in it. And it's just too much all in one meal. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was reviewing your book uh, the other day and it reminded me of something that's quite fascinating that, uh, uh, not everybody that has the genetic predisposition that gluten, gluten, uh, to celiac disease actually gets it. And so the majority do not. Yeah. yeah. And what, why is it? So we don't totally know, but this, is, this comes back to a concept that we were discussing earlier, which is that your genetic code is not a program for um, disease. That in, if you have the gene for celiac disease, 97% of the time, you never actually manifest the condition. So just 3% of people who carry the gene actually get it. Why is that we don't totally know, but what has been suggested by research in the last 10 years is that when there's damage to the gut microbiome, it will actually activate this gene. So it comes back to this concept that I described earlier of the switchboard and the microbes having the ability to activate 
or deactivate a gene. When it comes to celiac disease, it appears that it can be activated. There's no evidence that I've seen to date to say that once it's activated, it can be deactivated. And so basically, once you cross that line into having celiac disease, that is something that you would have for the rest of your life. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you mentioned in your book about the American uh, Genome Project, and you know there was a great hope around the American Genome Project that was going to lead to like a whole host of different cures for different diseases and that, and it didn't really pan out. Uh, does that get back to that switchboard concept that it's actually much more complex than just what's in the blueprint? In our yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah. I, I think I think it does get back to this. You know, they they really thought that when they cracked the genetic code, they would fix all of our health problems and we would live to be 150 years old. That's what they thought. Mm -hmm. And as you said, that it didn't pan out. I want to I want you want you to comment on food additives because this is something that I've wondered about. Like you mentioned that there are I think it was 10,000 potential food add additives in our food supply, primarily in processed foods which have been generally recognized as safe, but haven't actually been tested. And then you point out that when they're tested, the ones that have been tested have a negative effect on intestinal permeability and uh, uh, the makeup of our microbiome. And, and that made me, makes me wonder that these people that swear that the carnivore diet is the way to go to eliminate all plants, and they vilify carbohydrates, that really what it may be is that these additives in a standard American diet or what's screwing them up. It's got really nothing to do with carbohydrates per se. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I, so I, I have concerns that, um, I guess let me, let me frame it this way, that ultra processed foods are created in a laboratory in an unnatural way. Um, using a combination of different food additives that were introduced into our food supply without adequate evidence to demonstrate safety. And that once they're introduced into the food supply, it's been um, quite clear. I mean, I think actions speak louder than words. It's been quite clear that our governing bodies are not very quick to remove them. It's quite hard to get them removed. And so it's um, an unfortunate thing because it's hard to know what's doing what in this setting where there are 10,000 different food additives. And when 60% of our calories come from ultra processed foods, that means you have a mixture of hundreds of these on a daily basis that um, um, you just unfortunately aren't going to be able to discern what is creating issues that you may develop years from now. Yeah, I have I have real con sincere concerns that this is fueling many of the immune mediated uh, inflammatory conditions that we're dealing with, meaning like autoimmune disease or increased allergic type issues. It doesn't mean that every single one of them is bad. I'm not I'm not trying to claim that. I think that there are, the problem is that we just don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad because we haven't required that level of scrutiny prior to putting them into the food supply. And mm -hmm. so, um, so from my perspective, I think that, um, people who follow a carnivore diet, this is a framework that allows them to completely and totally eliminate ultra processed foods. Um, it also is a zero carbohydrate, zero fiber diet. I think that when they when they claim, like I don't think they're lying when they claim that their, for example, autoimmune disease improves. I think that they're I think that's a return to a diet that does not include these food additives, and who knows which food additive is causing those issues for them, triggering their immune system. When they claim that it's good for their gut health, I unfortunately don't think they actually understand what they're saying, and I don't mean that in in a disparaging way. Um, but, um, what they are interpreting as good for their gut health is that they don't have any bloating. Right. The reason that they had bloating is because they had a damaged gut. The reason that they have a damaged gut is in most cases, because they have through the course of their lifetime, not consumed any fiber. When your body is not adapted to consuming fiber, it can cause bloating. There are ways in which we can address that issue and make the gut stronger so that you can enjoy that food without restriction. 
Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, when they go on these meat only diets, they're kind of painting themselves to the corner because they're further limiting the diversity of their gut microbiome. That's exactly right. We, it would be conceptually similar to if you hurt your knee, you have a choice. You can lay on the couch and never move again. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you never walk on that knee, you will not feel discomfort. But you, over the course of time, will suffer consequences from that. Right. Your metabolism slows down, you gain weight, you become metabolically unhealthy. This leads to coronary artery disease and other health related issues. Um, what people do when they hurt their knee is not lay on the couch for the rest of their life. What they do is they rehabilitate the knee. The process of rehabilitation is being thoughtful to how you start to work that knee back into fitness. And in that process, you may feel some discomfort. You don't just have unlimited discomfort. It's controlled. You're being thoughtful about it. But there may be some in that process. And you work towards that goal of restoring functionality to the knee so that you're in a place where you can now get back to playing basketball and skiing and all these wonderful things, right? That's the way that we go about this. When it comes to our gut, withdrawing from fiber, withdrawing from plants is conceptually the same as laying on the couch and never walking again. And it's not actually making you more healthy. The way that we have to be about go about this is to reintroduce these foods, but in a thoughtful, strategic way, low and slow. It allows us to adapt to them, grow stronger, rehabilitate the knee, restore function, rehabilitate the gut, restore functionality, and get back to being able to consume these foods without restriction. Yeah. You know, there's, so, I mean, there's so many interesting things to talk about uh, from your book, but we're running low on time. But there's one last question I'd like to ask you is, you mentioned at the beginning when we were talking that you're involved in supplementation. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit about that? Because, uh, you know, there's a school of thought that if you're on a plant-based diet, the only thing you need is vitamin B12 and you're done. Do you have any thoughts on that? So I'm of the belief, I'm motivated by um, results above all else, right? And that, that to me supersedes like a philosophy. And so in the process of trying to achieve the best results, to me, the foundation, and this is what I have been pounding the drum on for years, and this is exactly what I did in my medical practice. You have to start with diet. Diet should be the driving factor for these things, right? And you take that as far as you can take it. And for each of us, that means different things. We're all doing our best. There's no such thing as perfect. I don't think anyone is. I think we should complement that with lifestyle. So, and lifestyle is not just exercise, although exercise is one way in which we can put lifestyle to work for our benefit. But to me, it's also other elements of sleep and socialization, human connection, and working on our stress. Um, So these factors are the factors that I talk about in my books. Um, And I think we should all, all, all should be doing them. But I also... I'm a very firm believer in the power of supplementation beyond these things. And supplements are not a replacement for food. And they're not the same as food. And they play a role in allowing us to optimize and go beyond what we're able to do with our diet. And I've seen this many times in many patients where, because I, my practice, I became known as friendly to people who wanted nutritional advice friendly to people who were on a plant-based diet, right? I was the doctor that they came to. And many of them still have digestive health issues. And they're doing everything right to the best of their ability. And what I discovered is that, again, supplements are not the same. Like um, we have, uh, our company 38 Terra has a prebiotic supplement that I formulated over the course of three years. And it's the product that I always wish that I could have had in my clinic. Because I think that it's a much uh, more um, uh, high-quality, science-fueled approach to supplementation for people that have gut issues. In my clinic, I had many people who were on a plant-based diet and still were suffering with gut issues. And it was shocking to me, the percentage of them that benefited from these particular types of things. 
So do I believe that every single person needs to be on, for example, a prebiotic supplement? No, I don't believe that. But I believe that there is a place where prebiotic supplementation allows us to actually support and nurture our gut microbiome in a way that's far more powerful than what we can do with diet alone. So to me, this is the way I approach that. I see. Now, are there any other like nutrients per se other than B12 and, and uh, in the appropriate cases, the uh, prebiotic supplements? Like, do you think we should be taking zinc or uh, long chain uh, omega-3s or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I, I mean, to me, to me, this would be, there, there's, there are the nutrients that if we look on a public health basis across the entirety of the United States, you would make an argument that we need more of those nutrients. And to me, examples of those are vitamin D and the long chain omega-3s, specifically DHA. Um, and, and, and certainly fiber <laughs> yeah. and polyphenols, right? And many of these things can be addressed through diet. So to me, we start with our diet. The question is, can we completely and totally address these things with our diet and get them to a place where we have nutritional sufficiency? Um, with uh, particularly long chain uh, omega-3s, I think the testing is the right way to go about this. But I think that saying that consuming seeds, chia flax and hemp, which I'm a big believer in, like I think every single smoothie should have chia flax and hemp. But I don't think it's appropriate to say that that by itself will actually address this issue for all people. Because particularly among men, there's a difference in the genders. So men don't process the, um, the uh, plant-based omega-3s as well as women do. And for people who are listening at home, there's three omega-3s, ALA, EPA, and DHA. ALA can be transformed into EPA. EPA can be transformed into DHA. These are enzymatic processes. But the problem is it's a, there's a loss. Only a small percentage of it actually makes the transition. And in men, it's um, uh, a lot less than it is in women. So even with attentiveness, to this particular uh, nutrient, many men are still deficient. And that to me is the role of supplements. And there are ways in which it can be accomplished in a way that's completely aligned with ethical views. Because in many cases, I believe that it's ethical views that are motivating sort of the conversation or the pushback. Um, so for example, you can have algae-based omega-3 supplements and get what that, that nutrient that you're looking for. Or alternatively, another that I would suggest is bivalves. So for people oh. who are vegan, it's actually quite fascinating to consider the possibility of oysters hmm. because there's actually no evidence that they have the ability to feel emotion, feel pain on any level. But they, they're filter feeders though, aren't they? Wouldn't you get a concentration of uh, organic pollutants through a bivalve? So, I mean, it depends, it, it would depend on where they're, where you're harvesting them from, right? So mm -hmm. if you're harvesting them from the bottom of a river where the river is carrying with pollutants, then yes, that would be, that would be potentially problematic. But if you were harvesting them from a farm with clean water, then that wouldn't necessarily be a concern. I see. Um, now, do you recommend that people get an omega-3 index before making the decision to take a supplement? Or just go ahead and take the supplement. No, I, I would. I think this is this is the level of personalization that I'm referring to. Is that um, there are some people that consuming chia flax and hemp is not going to be adequate. Getting an omega three index is the appropriate way to go about this. See where you stand. Like optimize your nutrition. Mm -hmm. See where you stand. And if you're not where you need to be, where I've seen this many times before, including people who eat a good diet, then that's where supplements come in. I see. So, okay. and I think the same is true with vitamin D, by the way, I think that vitamin D, particularly in Northern latitudes, um, is quite important and that there's a role for vitamin D supplementation during the winter time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's been great. I mean, uh, you know, we could have gone on for two more hours, but I know you've got a time commitment, uh, but, uh, really appreciate you having you on. Um, I'd love to pick your brain some other time if possible. Definitely. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.